was a consult to uh, uh, the movie with Hollywood, the movie production Fury, the movie if you've ever seen that movie. Um, he said he, he had the opportunity to meet Brad Pitt, who started the movie. I think Brad Pitt had the opportunity to meet Paul Ander. Um, anyway, uh, as you read his books, um, you'll be fascinated by many of his experiences. The last one he wrote, I think this is book number eight, uh, is the 24 times I almost got it. <laughs> uh, he talks about some of the experiences he had and the, the near-death experiences that he had fighting in World War II. Uh, he's now writing his ninth book. Uh, he is 94 and a half years old. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be just like the Paul. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, to you our, our uh, guest speaker today, uh, an American hero. Please join me in welcoming Paul Andrews. guy by himself, he's really had it. 
But if I stop two of you, they said, then what happens? He says, well, the man with the high, lowest serial number is in charge. There's always somebody in charge. There's always two men, two and one's in charge. Always remember that. And so uh, And so when he said that, uh, it came back to me in later time in, uh, during the Siegfried Line in Germany, during the Battle of the Siegfried Line, which we lasted 16 days in rain, thunder, lightning, artillery fire, both were and a lot of mud and all of that. And uh, we were involved in all of that. And they uh, asked us to go out and for me to send a patrol out to no man's land to see what's going on out there. And of course, uh, in today's deal, the no man's land doesn't apply very well. But in those days, of course, the Germans had their fortifications, we had ours, and in between was no man's land. And so we were to find out what was going on out there. Another saying came to mind right then is Patton always said, you never push spaghetti, you got to pull it. Because you, if you try to push spaghetti, it'll just wall up. But if you get in front, you can pull it, and it'll go everywhere you want it to go. And that's who a leader is. He's the man that pulls the spaghetti. So anyway, I had that habit of, well, I'll pull the spaghetti. So I did it as many times. But this time, I picked another fellow, and we went out to no man's land, and we're out there. And uh, uh, a German patrol was out there also, so I had him be real quiet while they went on through. And after they passed, I turned to this young fellow and I said, let's continue now. And we were putting up booby traps is what we were doing. And uh, uh, so he was gone. I was by myself. And so I thought to myself, well, I'll, I could put out a couple more traps and then I'll go, go in. And then suddenly it, it came to me, never one man alone. So I said, what the hell am I doing here? So I decided to get out of there. So I started out. Number one, another saying that was always given to us, we all make mistakes, but the one that makes the less mistakes wins. That's war. That's the way it is. It's full of mistakes. But you make the less, you could win. And so we're out there, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out there with the trying to see what I was going to do, and I, I decided, hell, I would get out of here. So instead of going back in the same way I came out, and all you soldiers know this, if you're in a deal that you're out on reconnaissance or, so, or something, you always go back into the same area that you went out, so that they will know that you were out there. I didn't do that. I made another mistake. I started straight back. And as I started straight back, the tanks that were in a depolate position started firing their machine guns because they heard people out there. And it was me. And I started hollering, cease fire, cease fire. Here's a no man's land. I'm hollering, cease fire. <laughs> and so we, I, when I got up to the tanks, one of the tankers got out and he said, what the hell are you doing? And I said, uh, didn't they tell you we were out here? And, uh, and he said, no, that's another rule. They always pass on down the line that there's somebody out there. And they, they, the word didn't get all the way down, so they didn't know I was out there or there was anybody out there. So anyway, uh, uh, that those are uh, never one man alone. Make the fewest mistakes. All of that came back to me. These were things that uh, most of it came from Patton as time went on. You know, we called him Blood and Guts. And uh, the reason we called him that, we always said, yeah, it's our blood and his guts. Because he was always, you know, forcing you to move, move, never stay still. And another famous saying he had, always move. And the reason you move is because a moving target is a lot harder to hit than a stationary target. And, uh, and that's another rule of war is move, move, move. And uh, 
There was cases that we couldn't move when we were stuck in a defensive position, particularly in the Siegfried Line in Germany, where we were stuck there for 16 days and, uh, and we couldn't move because they had us zeroed in on, and the American men know what I mean by I say zeroed in. They had us zeroed in so we couldn't move. And uh, so, uh, and it was then that uh, another thing happened that suddenly came to mind and it isn't in the notes. I had a, a guy that was part of my outfit and we called him Dynamite Dean. And the reason we called him that, he was always jumping on enemy vehicles and trying to start them. And I always had to preach to him, you don't do that, that may be booby trapped and you blow us up. And he used to, and he'd tell me, he said, what are you complaining about? He says, because if it was booby trapped, you and I both be dead, you know? So uh, what we did with him is we had him always uh, in his squad, uh, the third squad, my third squad, I was platoon sergeant, I had 48 men in there. He was in the third squad. And it was called the demolition squad. And they carried a certain amount of TNT with them. And so they put the TNT on him and had him follow them, say, 30 yards behind us. So don't, don't get in there with us. So that was Dynamite Dean. So uh, during the the Siegfried Line deal, what happened to him, he, he got buried in the mud when one of our tanks backed up. Just before that, his squad leader was killed, and he was a sergeant, he was private first class. And I said, you're in charge of the take over the squad. He says, I don't want a bed. I don't want that. And I said, he says, I'm just a sergeant. I mean, a private first class. And I said, well, I make you a sergeant. Get in there and get up there. and." Uh, take over the squad. So he went over there behind the tank that his squad was there. And uh, the Germans opened up and the tank suddenly threw in reverse and backed up and, and hit him and buried him in the mud. And the mud was real heavy there. And, uh, so right away when it happened, I looked and I said to myself, he's dead. So I turned him in as killed in action. Now, about 10 months later, in St. Louis, after the war, I heard the doorbell ring, and I lived upstairs, I run down the stairs, I opened the door, and Dynamite Dean stood there. And I said, what in the hell are you doing here? I said, you're supposed to be dead. Those were the exact words I used. And he said, well, let me show you. And he opened his shirt up, and he said, see that? That's, I got uh, tank tracks on his chest, and he did have tank tracks on his chest. He said, and I got silver knuckles on my backbone. And he said, uh, uh, what happened? He said, when they come up to take the, the bodies out and all that, they said, we'll pick him up last. He's done for. He says, I heard that. And when I heard it, I started moving in the mud. And they say, hey, wait a minute. He's alive. So they pulled me out. And he spent six months in the hospital. But the miracle of all of this is he introduced me to the girl I married that night. Uh, he was saved for a reason, and that was to get me the right gal that I had for 67 years. I got off the target, but I had not mentioned that one because it did. It, did. it was. It turned out to be, you know, very, very important, and uh, and he was quite a boy. And uh, uh, I got him in the new book I'm writing now. And uh, 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 let me. Go. Oh, and another favorite uh, word that Patton always used for us. He says, "Never." Die for your country. Let the other BS die for his country. <laughs> and that was his rule. Shoot first. Always shoot first. And he says the reason you shoot first is because if you don't, the other guy's going to shoot you and you'll be dead. So you shoot first. Then if he can still talk, ask him who he was if you want to. But shoot first. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the rules today that uh, some of the Marines were telling me recently is that uh, 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 after so many times that they had to keep calling in for permission to shoot, uh, 
when they were finally told to shoot, they were told to shoot low. And they said, why? Well, they said, you wouldn't be shooting to kill, you'd be disabling them. They said, but what if I shot a man in the leg and he had a rifle in his hand, that wouldn't keep him from shooting me. So why in the hell would you give an order out like that to shoot low? And that this Marine, uh, he told me that uh, just recently at the Marine Mall, that that's what they were told. And uh, so anyway, uh, dying for your country. Uh, shoot first and ask afterwards. Kill or be killed. And uh, that's another thing. I, I, I got getting off the target again. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that, that uh, uh, they decided to find out, the War Department did, or the Defense Department is called out, is the why the young people were put in the infantry. And here, these four generals that were involved, and uh, I don't know how much they knew, but here's what they came up with. They came up with the fact that the young fellows were put in the infantry because the, when you're down there at 18, 19, and 20 years old, you don't think twice, you fire. If you were 26, which they were considered as an older person at that time, if they put those kind of guys in the infantry, they would stop and say, well, well, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? They said, we don't have time in war to say, should I or shouldn't I? We just have to do it. And so that's why the youngsters were put in the infantry. I thought that was a very interesting analogy. And, uh, but that's what they decided on. That was about five years ago. Okay. Um, General Patton was never wrong. He was always right, and uh, that was according to him. He was always right, and uh, he, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I could mention very quickly, he had a, would hold inspections on Saturday uh, at Fort Benning, a surprise inspection, and one time he, he did it to our company. And when he did it, I they told us he was gonna do it, he's coming, and so uh, fall out, and I, I had a guy from New York that was really a slob, and not that all of New Yorkers are slobs, but this is one. And so I had him, uh, I said, go to the latrine, that's the part of the, where the hell you want to call it today. I said, stay there and don't come out until the general's gone. And so I thought he did it. So when we fell out in the formation, here he is in the formation. And we're going up and down the line and it's general uh, Patton is here and uh, my battalion commander's with me and we're going up and he, he comes across this guy, real slow. He says, Sergeant, bust this man. And I says, sir, he's already a corporal. I mean, he's already a private. He says, make him a corporal and then bust him. <laughs> you know, the, he was never wrong. He was always right. So, uh, uh, that, that was a, another case. Uh, we, uh, uh, I, I got another one here. Uh, now, boy, that, and I always stop and think of this every once in a while. We had a Baptist chaplain named Chaplain Chun, and he was about this tall. His helmet covered his face just about when he had it on. And he was with us in Sicily when we uh, were attacking a town, and. Uh, and we had to go up the mountain to get to the town and, and we were with Darby's Rangers on that one and, and yet Gila Sicily. So while we're climbing the mountain, all the while the ships out at sea were firing on this town and Butera was the name of the town. And uh, uh, it was the high ground and you have to always take the high ground because they could see everything you're doing. So we had to take to Butera. So, uh, during the night while we're climbing the mountain, and we weren't minor, mountain climbers, but uh, the Army Rangers and us were climbing this mountain, and Chaplain Chun is with us. And uh, everybody just cussing all the time going up this mountain. And uh, so uh, uh, he would keep saying, now boys, now boys. And I never forget the answer he got to that. One of the guys said, now boys, hell, Chaplain. 
He says, when we get it and we die and we go up there and we go by St. Peter, he's going to say, where did you serve? And we're going to say in the infantry, and he's going to say, pass on through, you already served your time in hell. So I always remember that one. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, and then I'd be young, being young. Well, before I do that, I, I do want to say something else here. You know, they talk about atheists in foxholes. I was 30 months in the combat zone, in seven campaigns and three invasions, and not one time did I ever see or hear an atheist. Never. And uh, the men that I ran across that would be wounded or killed or be laying there long that I would kneel down by them for a minute, none of them would ever have anything much more to say help me God or uh, something asking the Lord for help no atheist in a foxhole never saw one I've never had anyone come to me and said well we were there and we would not allow a chaplain or anything around us and I said well you wasn't in very good combat because uh, you, 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 were, you were not that way because I want to tell you when the, when the going gets tough the tough has to get going and you got to go and uh, and the uh, uh, atheists uh, whatever they're they'll eventually come around I, I believe most of them but uh, I just want you to know that as far as I'm concerned there weren't any and I never ever ran across any okay uh, I, uh, I have a note here kind of young and that reminds me of uh, 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 General Eisenhower, when uh, I met him at Casablanca, but also uh, he visited us at Tidworth Garrison in England before the invasion. And uh, he, uh, he and Churchill and Bradley and some of them visited us. And uh, of course, we had to prepare all of, all kinds of things for them and uh, uh, for the inspection and all that that they were going to do. And when the train came into Tinworth Garrison, we're all lined up there, and, uh, and the generals all came out to the front of the train, and they just stood there, and we were wondering, well, what are they standing there for? And it turned out, who well, they were standing there for, they were waiting for Churchill. Well, Churchill got out at the back of the train. He always liked to pull crazy things like that. He got out at the back of the train, and he was already walking among us and, and talking, and, and uh, you know, uh, and we weren't even called to attention or anything because uh, uh, we we didn't pay attention. Well, we were glad to see him, but, but they, when they found out at the front of the train that Churchill was already among us, then they call everybody to attention, and then uh, they come up and down the line. And I was a platoon sergeant, and uh, so uh, when the uh, uh, Eisenhower went right by me, and he, he looked at me, and he says, uh, "Kind of young." to be a platoon sergeant, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir. He said, you lied about your age, didn't you? And I said, yes, sir. And so he says, well, he says, you know, he says, I'm from Abilene. He was from Abilene, Kansas, and that's he talked to little bit. He talked to little bit. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. I got to talk to the guy that eventually even became president of the United States. And so uh, and that was uh, uh, General Eisenhower and kind of young. Uh, I also have a note here, uh, uh, who are you? Uh, we, uh, we had a deal in, uh, during the invasion of Normandy that uh, uh, we were at a town called Pont Brocard. And at, 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 Pont, at Pont Brocard, uh, we had a, quite a battle there. Uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> what happened is I was blinded for a while, first of all, because uh, uh, whenever you set up a, a roadblock, and which we did a lot of because of our equipment, uh, being an armored, uh, I was in the second armored division, so it was armored infantry, so I had five half tracks and anti-tank guns and wire and all that stuff, mines, we carried all of that. And so we set up roadblocks. 
but we set up a roadblock in Fox Road Car in order to keep them from coming in to put the blank while the division moved on. <coughs> and so while we were doing that, uh, 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 they attacked us. And uh, the part about that was that they, uh, there, there were no tanks in that group. There were more half tracks than anything else, but they had uh, Red Cross stars on them that they were medic, but they weren't medic. They were all armed, and they were they were disguising themselves as medics. Figured that they could get in the middle of us and do something. So uh, we had quite a firefight with them there, and and so they retreated, and we knew they would be coming back. So in that interim, some guy comes up to the front and uh, where we are. And he has a camera. And I said, who are you? And he says, I'm from Time Magazine. And somebody told me his name was Lindsay. And I said, Lindsay from Time Magazine. He was involved in World War II. And I said, you're an American? He says, yeah. And I said, you see that weapon right there? I said, pick it up. Put the damn camera down and join us in this next fight. You're an American. He says, I'm a reporter and I'm neutral. And I said, then you get the hell out of here. So I chased him away. And so uh, he left. The only reporters that were allowed in World War II was the Army reporters. And their job was to take all kinds of pictures. And you've seen some of them. They called them Army photographs. And they were turned into division headquarters. They couldn't release them to anybody. They were given to division headquarters. And division headquarters would decide where the film would go. So that was the rule of it in World War II. Now, you got to have a damn guy running behind you with a camera, and you, you need to turn around and knock him on his butt is what you need to do. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, okay. Um, oh, and, 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 and when, uh, when we're in this one town here, I, uh, we went out in front of the anti-tank gun, which we always do, uh, to review see what's out there. So I would again uh, pull the spaghetti instead of pushing it. And I went out there with the, one of the sergeants. And uh, as we went out in front of the gun, we were down, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 yards or something. And we heard noise in the woods there, and there were Germans talking. So I had a submachine gun, and he had his carving. And so we emptied out all of our bullets into the area there where the voices were coming from. And we heard all kinds of ox and all that from them. And so we turned around and we run back because we know they would be after us. So running back, the uh, my Sergeant Cermak was a lot faster than me, so he beat me to run past the anti-tank gun. And we always kept the round in the gun ready to fire when we set up a roadblock. So as he crossed past the 57, he pulled the lanyard and fired the weapon. I'm still out to the right front of the gun. And the blast goes, shh, and it blinded me. I couldn't see anything, and so I ran in. They said I ran into the building on fire, and then they, they pulled me out and uh, took me to the <laughs> command half track, my, my half track that I had the big radio in. And the company commander was in another town, and he was calling me, and he's saying, what's going on? And I said, as soon as I could see, I'll tell you. He said, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, I'm blind. And so, and actually I was. And uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, he kept telling me, just sit still and your eyesight will come back. And it, it took maybe 20 minutes or so and my eyesight came back. And, uh, so I, I, I still have a blinded left eye, but uh, that's all I got out of that. I came out all right and so on. That, that went on. Okay. Now, uh, um, I'm watching the time here. Uh, the, uh, okay, we went, we went on then, and then we uh, um, went, uh, we went to the Rhine River, the Roar River, the Elbe River, all of those rivers we went, went uh, uh, to cross them and that, and the Roar River. Uh, well, first of all, I was wounded in St. Dennis Le Gas during the, in, in the, uh, the St. Paul breakthrough. And uh, we were told to wear camouflage suits, and then they woke up and said that the enemy wore camouflage, take them off, because you'll be 
uh, classifying as enemy and they'll be shooting at you. And so everybody took off their camouflage uniforms except us because the second armored division was already moving. And incidentally, the second armored division during the invasion was called the Galloping Ghost. They did not reveal who we were until August of 44 in the newspapers. They released the name of the armored division that was in that deal at the St. Low and all that, and that was the second armored division. And we, anyway, we were in camouflage. So uh, because we were, we were attacked by our own aircraft. And uh, uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the planes that dived on my half track killed my driver. And I'm standing here at a ring mount 50 caliber, and he's right there. And it got him, <coughs> spared me. And uh, we had to jump out and throw a, uh, our uh, identification colors out and for the aircraft to see us. And then uh, the aircraft, if they recognized you, would wave their wings like this, they recognized you. So uh, and the second plane never dove dove on us, but the, the first plane did kill my driver. But anyway, uh, uh, so at St. Dennis the Gas, they decided that uh, uh, we would take care of the south end of town and somebody else take the north end of town. We, we took care of the south end of town. We put our anti-tank gun up and put our half tracks in a safe area because they only had water and steel and we had a lot of equipment on them and we wanted to protect them. So during the night, the first night, we were told to move up to the north end of town because the enemy broke into the north end of town. So we're, we're heading up to the north end of town and I'm a good soldier, you know. I, I, I told the uh, officer that he was from the regimental headquarters and uh, ordered me to go up there and stop the enemy they're coming through. And so while we're going up there, I got to thinking, all that clang, clang, clanging that's going on, those are German tanks. I knew what they looked like. Sounded like because I'd been in Africa and Sicily, so I knew what it was. And so I got to thinking, what are we doing? We have nothing to stop those tanks, and the first tank to go around the corner is going to fire that tank because that was the rule they always cleared the street first. And so I told everybody, get out of here, and uh, assemble back at the half drive. So, Everybody took off, and I got ready to took off, and I made a mistake. <coughs> Another mistake. I was against a wall, and I couldn't go anywhere because it was too high, or I thought it was too high anyway. So I'm holding on to the wall, and I'm saying, "Good Lord, help me!" And the first German tank came around the corner, and he fired, and the blast from the cannon raised me up on the wall with my guardian angel, I always said he had to be there. Help me get up on top of the wall and fall on the other side. When I fell on the other side, I had a piece of a fragment in my hand and one in one leg, and I couldn't walk, but I could crawl, so I crawled. And so we we crawled and got together and, and uh, helped in the defense of the town, but that's how I was wounded the first time. And so what happened is people would tell me, Paul, what was that tank? Was it a tiger? Was, did it have an 88? I, you think I'd stand in the middle of the street waiting to see what that tank had? Well, I knew he had a big gun and he was going to shoot the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, after crawling around that night, the next day they, uh, they come and uh, find out where I was and uh, they said he's laying over there and he got hit last night and he wouldn't leave and that uh, he crawled around and set up different defensive positions and that. Uh, so they flew me to England. And so uh, while I was in England, I woke up in the hospital and uh, uh, all the Americans were over here and I was over here by myself. And there was two guards by my bed, two MPs. And I, I raised up and I said, what the hell is going on here? And they searchers run over there to them and they says, you're an American. I said, damn right I am, you know, and I took my dog tags out and shook them and, and I said, you never even checked it. Because all we did was cut your leg and open and take the stuff out of your leg and we took the stuff out of your hand. But we left you here to be interrogated because you were the enemy, because you were the camouflage. And so uh, 
Uh, of course, then I just raised hell all over the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> they sent me to two psychiatrists. <laughs> One of them said, you're crazy. And I, I said, no, I'm not. So they sent me to another psychiatrist. And he said, uh, well, you're not crazy. He said, but we'll do you a favor. That's what's that? He says, uh, you were in free invasion, so I'm sending you home. I said, no, you're not. And he said, what the hell is there wrong with you now? And then I said, I want to go back to my guys. He said, you want to go back and get shot in some more? I said, you don't understand. We're brothers. We all work together. We all train together. We all fight together. And I'm not going to go home and be listening to the radio wondering what's happened to those guys. I want to be there with them. So he says, you are crazy and I'm sending you back. So they did send me back. So uh, anyway, uh, and uh, oh, and the nurses wanted to come with a uniform, so I gave it to them. And, uh, so somebody said you should have kept it, but what the heck would an infantryman do carrying a camouflage uniform with him all the time? Because you, you, if you're a, if you're in the infantry, you can't keep anything, and you, you uh, and you definitely wouldn't be caught with a German weapon on you by a German. You made sure that you, and if you're going to get captured or possible, that you didn't carry a German weapon because uh, they, they most of the time they just kill you right there. Because they figured you killed somebody and you took that over with. So uh, anyway, uh, so anyway. Uh, that went on, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking here again. Uh, oh, as as uh, and then we uh, we went to the Boer River, and uh, and uh, oh, I, on my way back, I got back. And, and, no, that was a, that was the second time I was going up. Still the first time I was going up. And uh, we went through Belgium and Holland and, and into Germany, and. Uh, and during that time, I, as a young Belgian boy that joined us, and we called him Belgian, he was probably about 15, he had a dog, and he wanted to join us. So we put a little uniform on him and let him join us. And he would sleep in the foxhole with us, with the dog and all that. And, uh, and uh, we were moving pretty fast through there. And uh, so uh, the Belgians and the Holland people loved us and so forth. And we had a, uh, you know, we didn't have too much of our fight in Belgium or Holland. But when we got to the German border, the company commander said, Paul, you release him. We don't take him into Germany. So I had that same goal, and I never did find out his name or anything like that. But uh, anyway, uh, later on, after the, the Siegfried Line situation, we uh, uh, we went to the <coughs> Roar River. We were going to cross the Roar River, and uh, as uh, we were getting ready to cross the Roar River. They decided we need to put Bangalore torpedoes in the wire and up high so they blow down and then knock out any mines so the tanks could have a way to go through. So again, pull the spaghetti. So I took, went out there with the torpedoes and put them in the wire, in the German wire, and uh, we put the petrol caps on it and all that, running back to the hole to set the charge off. And, on the way back, I got hit by artillery, and so I was wounded to get. And so, uh, anyway, uh, uh, I, I was sent to Holland, and uh, they were bombing Holland so bad, so I was sent to Germany, and uh, they were, uh, weather was so bad that, that, that the plane they sent us in crashed in a German, in a, in a British airfield, and four British girls took care of us. Uh, they were the British airfield, and each one of us had four girls taking care of us after the plane came in on its nose, and they pulled us out of the plane. And the uh, Americans, as soon as they found out where we were, got us out of there, because that was one of the best nights we had in the war. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I went to the replacement depot. They were real hungry there, so I went AWOL from the replacement depot, went down to the English Channel, and bumped a ride back across the English Channel to get back to my outfit, and I was AWOL from the, from the replacement depot. <coughs> so it, uh, I was absent without leave and court-martialed in England, but I was on my way back to the front. And on the way back across to the English Channel, we got sunk by another ship hit us, and uh, sunk the ship I was on, an LCI, and uh, 
so they, we got a, a rope ladder up on the uh, other ship. <coughs> and, and so when I got up on there, the captain to help me uh, uh, get a ride across uh, said, didn't do any favors because if, you, if anything had happened to you out there, you would have been a deserter from the American Army and you would have been dishonored in the United States. But I didn't think of that. But anyway, I, I got back to my outfit across Germany, I mean, across Belgium, Holland, and back into Germany in time for the Battle of Oaks. The Battle of Oaks happened on the, 20, on the 16th, and I got there on the 22nd. We had a big fight on Christmas Day against the 2nd Panther Division at the Buse River, and, uh, and was able to defeat them, and there's a lot of stories about that, but I won't go into it. But then we moved on, we went through the Rhine River, the uh, on to the Elbe River, and, uh, and then uh, on the Elbe River we, uh, is where the, the war sort of ended in that time. And the only thing I want to say about the Elbe River is that uh, uh, we couldn't get our tanks across, so we went across uh, in boats, and, uh, and we were trying to move the enemy away from the Magdeburg, where we were trying to get across and get the tanks uh, across and we couldn't get any tank bridges made because they kept blowing them up and we're trying to get them away from there. <clears throat> While we're up there, the, the colonel in charge of the, of, of, of the uh, battalion was with me and uh, so we're moving up and we hear the German tanks coming after we got so far. He says, those are German tanks. I says, I know that because there's no, we don't have any tanks across the river. And he says, stop them. I said, with what? He said, with a bazooka. I said, if there's more than one tank, the one with the bazooka, you, when he fires, it's going to be placed, it's going to be exposed, and he's going to be dead. Or the two guys are going to be dead. So he says, I don't care. He said, stop him. And he took his crew and he left. Run away. And so this is the colonel, and I'm a sergeant. So I, I waited till he got out of sight, and I said, come on. And my guys and I, we retreated also went back to the, to the river, and, uh, and uh, of course he raised hell with me about it, but I told him you ran first, and I knew he was just a lieutenant in the United States, so I got away with that all right. <laughs> we moved up to a town, and, uh, and uh, on, the, on the enemy side of the hill, and I'm getting right at the end of it, uh, what happened is, <clears throat> I had a new company commander, but the other one was just killed, and I had a new one. And uh, he says, I'm going to go into that town as we're moving up. And I said, no, let me send scouts out. He said, no. So he and the executive officer went into the town. A little while they come, he come running out, the executive officer, and he says, Captain Stryker was killed right there. And he was shot in the mouth while he was talking. And he had his mouth open, and the bullet went in here and came out over here and never ever destroyed his mouth. And uh, so I got a call from the other side of the river from General Hines, and he said, uh, uh, let me speak to your company commander. And I said, he's dead. He said, let me speak to the executive officer. I said, he's shot in the mouth. I got his mouth bandaged up. He says, who in the hell are you? And I said, I'm Sergeant Andrew. And I used to ride motorcycle for him in the United States at peacetime and when he was a major. Now he's a general. And he says, uh, what the hell are you doing there? I said, guys like you put me here. That's what I mean. <laughs> so uh, he said, you got to get out of there. And so uh, we, we uh, went on down to find a way to get across. And that was the day Roosevelt died, and there was a big story about that, which I won't go into. But anyway, we ended up 60 miles from Berlin. And uh, during that time, uh, uh, General Simpson, our commander then uh, said I could be in Berlin in one night that we're only six about. Eisenhower said no, because the Russians were fighting for Berlin. Two Russian armies were fighting to see who would get credit from Stalin for taking Berlin. So they were shooting each other, and Eisenhower didn't want us in the midst of that. And so we didn't go. But I didn't go either because they wanted me to take the commission. I wouldn't take it. So I <coughs> I said, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going home. And they said, uh, what do you mean? I said, I got, I had 132 points at that point, and, and that was quite a bit of points, and so I couldn't uh, go home. And so I said, I'm going home. 
So they said, all right, so they sent me home. I was out of the war in June of 45, and it was, the war wasn't over until August of 45. So I was out of the World War II before the war was over in Japan, but it was over in, in Europe because it ended on May 9th in Europe. So I was home on June the 23rd. So anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, and uh, I think that maybe I, uh, I, it's already 10 to 12. But, uh, what, what, what else should we do right now, maybe? <laughs> I think it would be fun if, if some of you have a question. We have a portable mic. There are also um, cards and pens on each of the back tables that you want to write a question and bring it up. We've got a few minutes for that. Can you pass Paul if you have any questions? Or you want to say anything? I have a fluent theory of the vice president of our veteran group now. And, uh, and then uh, Mr. Rule, he, he's also a part of our group. That's present these three gentlemen as well uh, to thank them for their service uh, to our country. I've got one for Paul too, but it's kind of hidden under here, so let me, let me grab it if I could. My thing is, uh, this got mixed up in the uh, papers that we passed out, but it was a letter I wrote to the Queen of England. And uh, uh, you, uh, uh, everybody says, you, well, first of all, if you don't do anything, nothing will happen. That's number one. Number two is I decided that she was 90 years old. I would tell her I knew her when she was 60. <laughs> so I, I wrote 
the letter to her, and uh, they, uh, everybody said, you'll never get an answer from her, but I did. She did answer me, and uh, she uh, sent her picture, and she, uh, uh, everything that uh, went with it, and so forth, and uh, so anyway, she's, uh, uh, they're now dating. <laughs> Have a new pen pal. <laughs> Let's give it up for Paul one more.